So I did want to read, I got an email actually after one of our last shows from uh, one of our listeners overseas. He's living in China uh, and he had some questions regarding, well, I'll just read it and we can, we can touch on it because I thought it was really nice for him to reach out. So it says, greetings, Paul, a all. Uh, maybe you can read and answer this during the next podcast. I listen to the podcast every week and have been since the start. Thank you, Chris, uh, for your fellowship. Uh, I was probably one of the original six you guys mentioned. Remember I was saying we only had six downloads last September. Mm -hmm. uh, I currently live in China, but after 12 years, we'll be returning back to Ottawa area next year around June. We started looking for houses during our last visit in 2016 and almost purchased a home in Canada for just under 500000 And now we're kicking ourselves in the ass for not committing. We were supposed to move back early last year, but the world fell apart and then the housing prices skyrocketed. He said, you don't by any chance have a time machine, do you? I don't, but talk to Mr. Campbell. He very well might. Uh, he's a bit more of a wizard than I am. Uh, we honestly don't know what to do. We don't know if we should try to buy while we're living abroad, which seems like way too much work. I'm a Canadian citizen, but my wife isn't. Or should we just wait until next summer to start shopping again? People have been telling me to simply rent a place for a year to readjust to the area and then look for something while renting. Watching these housing prices rise is excruciating. When is the bleeding going to stop? Keep up the good work of the podcast. P.S. I like the banter at the beginning. <laughs> well appreciate uh appreciate chris's uh listening from from china which we apparently this week we are actually ranking in china you know he's yeah. not the only one in china listening to us um the i think a couple of aspects on the biggest aspect to chris's question circles around down payment um and what what investments or savings you have or capital that you have in order to put into your down payment, even though you're a Canadian citizen, because you are working and living abroad, you are considered a non-resident, um, which then the, um, it's the minimum you could put down is 35% as a down payment on a purchase. Um, so regardless of your citizen, as long as you're, as soon as you're not considered a non-resident and you're not filing taxes in Canada, um, the banks look for you to put a larger amount of down payment down. So with that said, if you have the savings or the investment uh, capital to, you know, to satisfy that 35%, then it's certainly something you could look at doing now, purchasing while abroad, either rent it out um, until you move back or what have you to take advantage of the natural appreciation market. Alternatively, if that's not the case, then you would have to wait until you come back and you have employment here, um, working locally, and then being able to put as little as 5% down. Um, that's, you know, really kind of, it really comes down to what your down payment and, and, you know, kind of really, I think the down payment is the biggest aspect in my, in my mind. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Paul. No, I mean, it's a very good point. I mean, there's a, there's a few, um, few pieces of information, like you mentioned that we kind of have to have in order to properly advise on options, but as far as timing, um, yeah, I mean, I think you said it. I think you hit the nail on the head there, Dave. I mean, there's if you, if they're able to come back prior to that, which is probably going to be very challenging. And I mean, China's not exactly uh, Toronto uh, as far as like proximity. So you know, I would say you know it's it's worthwhile keeping an eye on the market. But uh, my opinion, if you're if you're coming back next June, you know, I would just probably continue to put further money aside to maybe bolster that down payment and then be a bit more aggressive next year when you come back. Cause it, I mean, even shopping abroad is very challenging if you can't actually physically go into the space yourself and you know, you're, you're relying on your real estate agent or whomever to, to tell you that it's a good investment opportunity. So personally, I think if you're buying a home, you got to be in there, you got to feel it. You got to, you know, see if it's actually what you want because a lot of times things, you know, pictures can look really good and then you get in there and just the feeling of the space is not what you want to be living in or anything like that. So uh, all money aside, like just from a optic, like a, you know, if you're going to be living in this property, in my opinion, I think it's better to actually physically be in there. So if you're able to come back before next June, then I would say it's worthwhile, you know, throwing some numbers around. And even if you have to carry it remotely, you know, if you can come back before next summer, which is, you know, pretty close now, I guess we're only eight months away. I still feel like it's like August. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you could come back and say, you know, December of this year, you find a property or some good opportunities and you, you pull the trigger on it. I mean, I think that wouldn't be a bad idea to just even carry it for that six months on your own abroad so that you can have something ready to kind of turn key when you come back. But otherwise, again, like to me, if you're buying a place to live in, you gotta, you gotta physically be in there and feel it and, you know, walk around the property and actually be, you know, present for that decision. 
but that's me personally. I don't, that's not, I know some people can buy, you know, they'll buy in Arizona without, you know, sight unseen and don't care. So, uh, and it's different. I mean, this is a primary home. Obviously you're buying a cottage, you're buying a fishing shack or something, you know, it doesn't really take as much, uh, as much due diligence, but I mean, if you're going to be living in this with your family, I feel like you probably want to, you probably want to take a step in the property first. And, um, that would require you obviously to be here. So, <clears throat> and on the other side of that coin, I'll fire from a distance <laughs> and I don't need to be in it. <laughs> mm. True. That's what I mean. It's all, it's all, it's all relative. It's all relative. Yeah. yeah. No, the, I think, so something for, for those listeners that would be overseas, um, you know, aside from obviously, you know, seeing it and physically being able to, to be in it and see whether it's fits for your space. Something that's overlooked by people or, or that they're unaware of, um, your residency status, your working status, um, comes into play with regards to down payment and who you're working with as well, or working for, um, and which country. So if you're working in the U S uh, it's, you can get away with lesser down payment than if you're working, um, in China, uh, or Europe or what have you, or Australia, things like that. Um, you know, so there's that aspect. If you're a non-resident, you're a Canadian citizen, non-resident, if, or if you are in the process of moving abroad, uh, to anywhere else, I would say, um, you know, certainly keep any of your credit cards, lines of credit active and open to help continue keeping your Canadian credit alive. Mm -hmm. Uh, otherwise from a qualifying standpoint, what we do on the mortgage side is we'll look for alternative ways of qualifying your credit. So, um, you know, we'll look for an international credit bureau. We'll look for 12 months bank statements showing regular payments of to a credit card overseas or to a regular utility bill, things like that. Um, a letter from your local bank saying that you're in good standing, things like that. So there are different ways in which alternative credit when you're abroad is, uh, is defined, but, but certainly, you know, if you're in this case of Chris looking at maybe, maybe moving back and then shopping, um, something to keep in mind as well is that if you have employment and you're on probation, so typically a probationary period is three months, uh, you'll also want to ensure that, you know, you're not just buying something right when you come back and setting a quick closing date, because you'll need to not be on probation for that position as well. So that's something to keep in mind, um, going forward too. So those, uh, if you are living abroad, you have questions, feel free to, uh, to fire us any emails or, you know, about your individual situation. We can always help you out too. 